now approaching Rocket Park. We'll take a closer look at the rockets on the way back. For now, take yourself back to the year 1967. The Monkees, I'm a Believer, was a number one single, but the political climate was not so upbeat. Half a million American soldiers were stationed in Vietnam, and tensions of the Cold War were running high. The space program was under immense pressure to get a man to the moon before the end of the decade. On January 27, 1967, tragedy struck the Apollo program. Flight director Gene Kranz remembers that day. We were in mission control, testing the Apollo command and service model. Uh, the test that day hadn't been uh, going very well. We had problems with communications, we had problems with life support. We've been developing this next generation of systems. It's a really exciting time for everybody involved, and we're all thrilled to be a part of it. This building also houses the kitchens where the food is prepared for space flights. Space food isn't as futuristic as you might think. The astronauts eat a combination of fresh food like fruit and breads with some freeze-dried or specially prepared. Uh, the room you see before you is 100% the real deal, the same room that we use for all of our current active space shuttle missions today. When we say 100%, it's a little bit closer to 99% actually. The plants down here in the front, well they are fake, but everything else I assure you is real. Now the facility you all know as Johnson Space Center actually began construction back in 1961 and was completed in 1964. And we actually ran the majority of our missions out of another room on the other side of this building on the third floor. It's called Mission Operations Control Room 2. You may know it as Historic Mission Control. For the better part of 30 years, we used that room for the majority of our majorly historic missions. And then about 1995 or so, we decided to actually start decommissioning that room and set it aside as a National Historic Landmark. The room that we started to operate out of is the room that you see before you now. In 1996, we actually received full mission precedence and started running all of our active operations out of this room right here. And then ever since then, we've pretty much been using it for all of our space shuttle missions. I'm going to go ahead and talk about a quick uh, visual walkthrough, starting with a couple of the consoles. Uh, the second row and off to the left, you'll notice the plaque that says Flight Director. This person is the boss of all bosses in regards to the mission safety and success. Everybody in this particular room is going to report to that one person. They are actually charged with the full mission safety and responsibility duties. And uh, in the event that anything goes wrong, it's their head that the axe would fall upon, so to speak. Now. Everybody in this room, as I said before, does report to them, and that does give them the authority to make sure that anything and everything can be done to make sure that everything is you know, safe and successful. Now, that actually breaks down in three separate priority groups. We have first, the safety of the crew, after that, the safety of the uh, spacecraft, and then finally, the completion of the mission. Just as long as they're working within these three separate parameters, they are given the authority to do anything and everything being necessary to make sure that they can complete their mission. Now, this breaks down to the fact that they actually have more priority than the actual commander of the mission in space, the actual administrator of NASA, right down to the president of the United States himself. None of these three gentlemen or women, in any which case, can actually override the direct ruling made by a flight director. Now, directly to the right of him is going to be, or him or her, I should say, is a position called CAPCOM. CAPCOM stands for Capsule Communicator. This is the only authorized person at any given time that can actually talk to the astronauts while they're on an active mission. That all breaks down to a very simple fact. You have about 23, 24 different positions down here on the floor, all of which are very important, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Now, we can't have everybody talking at once to the astronauts, so for that reason, everybody relays all their messages over to Capcom. Capcom will receive them and start making a list, prioritizing what needs to go up first because it's important to mission success, and then the messages that can obviously, that can obviously wait for later will. Now, after they get their prioritization in order, they actually send up the messages one at a time to make sure that the astronauts can actually deal with the information that they're receiving. Now, there are smaller channels that we do have here in Mission Control that allow the astronauts to talk to their family members as well as the medical doctor. But as far as active operations are concerned, CAPCOM is the only authorized person to talk to them. Even the flight director has to relay their messages through CAPCOM. <coughs> Directly in front of CAPCOM is another position called the Flight Activities Officer, or FAO. This person is in charge of the scheduling that's for the astronauts while they're in active operation status, which basically includes the amount of uh, the day that they're actually awake for. So pretty much this person isn't going to be telling them, go to sleep, go to sleep. However, whenever it's time for them to wake up, whenever it's time for them to brush their teeth, pretty much do experiments, homework, any kind of work on the ISS, exercise, eating, everything else, right until the time it's pretty much time to go to sleep again. That's going to be the person relaying the message, telling them what to do at any active part of the day. Lots of the astronauts like to call it position mom. 
Now, way down in the front row is another three set of positions on the far left-hand side, trajectory, FDO, and guidance. FDO stands for Flight Dynamics Officer. The three gentlemen or women up at the front are actually in charge of all the flight maneuvers that we have with the space shuttle in regards to a mission. Nothing has ever done in space before. It's carefully rehearsed down here on the ground. Not only that, but the men and women down in the front row are actually ensuring that everything is going as accurately as, it, as, accurately as it possibly can while we're actually conducting a mission. This breaks down to the trajectory that we have for an orbital flight plan as well as all the burns necessary to achieve that orbital flight plan. So anything and everything involving movement of the spacecraft is going to be passed through those three persons up at the front row before anything actually takes place up in space. <coughs> Now, if you look over here on the left-hand side of the room, you'll notice the majority of our mission patches. This outlines the actual history of this room and the form of our active missions that have been completed. If you count them all together, you should count about 64 different patches in this particular room. If you literally do count each, in, each individual one, you'll notice them coming up a little bit short. That's because we do have an active side over here on the right. And this is where we keep all the mission patches that we're actively working on at this time. You'll notice our current mission patch uh, just before the double doors. It's the lowest of the series. It's representative of STS-133 with the Space Shuttle Discovery, scheduled to launch this Wednesday and the upcoming month of November. The mission is going to be sending the Space Shuttle back up to the ISS to basically bring up the majority of our hardware and spare parts and pieces that we'll need for continued operation within the next 10 to 15 years. We'll also be permanently attaching the multi-purpose logistics module as well as bringing up our functional version of Robonaut 2 which is one of our first the dexterous humanoid robots that we will have to assist our astronauts with our spacewalks in the future. Now all of these different items and components are being brought up on the Space Shuttle Discovery. Once again we're going to be utilizing our last remaining Space Shuttle flights to make sure that we have all of our hardware up in space for to continue our operations up until the year 2020-2025 or so. Now. If you look in the center map that we have over there, uh, you'll notice um, it's pretty, pretty much the globe laid out flat. And then along the S-curves that you see, then the white lines, there's going to be a white icon with a white circle. It's currently transitioning sides from the right to the left. And that's the actual exact location of the International Space Station. It's going to be coming around in the bottom left-hand corner pretty soon in the Pacific Ocean. Now, you'll see that icon flicker every now and again indicating movement, but it really doesn't do justice to how fast that vehicle is actually traveling at this time. The men and women on board are actually traveling at a constant speed of 17,500 miles an hour. That breaks down to roughly 5 miles a second. At that particular <coughs> speed, they're experiencing 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets in any given day. So the majority of the time, they're going, you know, Sunday, Monday, Sunday, Monday, and then here comes Sunday again. That's also one of the reasons why the flight activities officer is so important here in Mission Control. But for the men and women on the ISS, they'll actually be having another separate console for them. And it's in this room in the upper left to right hand corner of their live video screens. And they'll actually have their own flight activities, off like flight activities officer as well in these rooms, as well as various other consoles involved with actually controlling the ISS. The men and women on board the International Space Station are pretty much just along for the ride. They're up there to conduct experiments and maintain the actual spacecraft so that we can have it for the future to come. However, all of the flying involved with that spacecraft is done right here from that room in this building, in fact. The altitude, its attitude towards the Earth, the environmental systems, everything down to what temperature it is on board is controlled by those men and women there. <coughs> if you look at some of our live screens that we have shooting to and from uh, different locations of the Kennedy Space Center, You'll notice we have a digital clock running across the bottom and it is counting forward. This is representative of GMT, which is known as Greenwich Mean Time. It's based off of the prime meridian that divides the Earth in half. And that is pass over a town called Greenwich, England, hence the name. That is the actual clock that we run all of our active operations off of to make sure that all of our astronauts, men and women personnel in the various different locations that we have are all running at the same time schedule. Uh, this way we don't have to set our watches forward an hour, backward an hour, up forward a day and such. You know, this pretty much keeps us all running on one continuous clock. It counts forward the day, hour, minute, and second that we're currently working on at this time based off of once again that line located on the other hemisphere.